having two services for me, because I get to do this twice. You know, if you want to come twice, you can come to both services. Everybody know you can't do that, right? Father, we love you, and we're just, we're grateful. We're grateful this morning, God, because you love us. We don't deserve it. We want to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads. Water for my thirsty soul. I Like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony in my ears Like holy water on my Church, 
and then I visit a friend here in New England. He showed me around and he showed me people not knowing Jesus. We got over uh, 500,000 Brazilians living in all New England. And then I realized that God was calling us. We took the flight and we landed here in, in, uh, in Boston. 20 days after this, my wife delivered our daughter. I spoke uh, zero English at that time. It wasn't easy, our beginning here. I had to be strong for my wife and for my daughter. So I didn't give myself this opportunity to give up. And I remember that my first job was working at a Dunkin' Donuts. So I met a few Brazilians there and we started some small groups. And our focus was really specific to reach non-believers and to reach people who, who didn't know Jesus. So basically, my ministry is based on a friendship. And uh, the people who attend the church uh, are your friends. We started like gathering with people and we found a place. And, uh, we started doing Sunday services. When people give, they are really helping uh, some families to thrive and to survive, uh, especially uh, at the beginning of the journey. For me and for my family, it's been uh, uh, vital. What I'm learning is if God called you, He will provide. That's right. If God calls you, He will provide. And one of the ways that God provides is through the North American Mission Board offering. That's our Easter offering, our Annie Armstrong offering. And so all throughout the month of April, um, anytime you give to our special mission, as it says um, online, that goes directly toward uh, missionaries, just like the guy from Brazil. And, you know, one of the things I find very interesting um, about this video is this man came from Brazil to be a missionary in the United States. Um, and that should tell you a little bit uh, about our country right now and how outsiders look in and see us. They see that we need Christ, and especially up there in the Northeast. I have a brother-in-law right now that pastors um, up there in the Northeast, and that's how hard, that's a mission field. It really is, and we need to be praying for these missionaries. Uh, that are going not just all over the world, but some just right uh, a couple of states over from us, planting churches and sharing the gospel. Uh, but thank you for being here this morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Eden. We're excited that you're here this morning and we get to worship the Lord together. And so let's get started as we pray together. If you pray with me, Heavenly Father, God, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come and to worship this morning. Lord, I pray as we come into this place, Lord, as the body of Christ, Lord, I pray that we will worship in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that as we come together, that we'll put aside every hindrance, that we put aside all of the distractions in our life. Lord, that we will focus, God, on what you are doing today and what you are trying to do in us. Lord, we thank you. May we take advantage of this opportunity right now to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we worship?
Father God, we are so thankful. We are so thankful that you are a way maker. We are so thankful that even when we don't see you working, you're at work all around us. You're at work inside of us. And Lord, I pray that if there is anybody that has not experienced the, your work of redemption in their life, I pray that today is that day for them. Lord, I pray as we open up your word right now, Lord, may your spirit be ignited inside of us. Move us to respond. And Lord, that those that don't know you, Lord, may your spirit in this moment begin that work of conviction and drawing them in. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. All right, if you have your Bibles, we're in Luke chapter 24 this morning. Luke chapter 24, as we continue our series, Faithful. So the last couple of weeks, we started this series uh, pretty much uh, on Palm Sunday. And we, we were there at the triumphal entry as Jesus rode in on that cult uh, into Jerusalem. And the, at the triumphal entry, we saw our faithful king riding in to his death. And as they laid down the palm branches and they shouted Hosanna, moments later, they were going to be shouting, give us Barabbas, you know, crucify him. But Jesus, in all of his faithfulness, the faithful king that he is, laid down his life for his people. And then lastly, we Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we looked at a faithful God. That despite this sinless world, despite this lifeless existence that we have, he gave his one and only son, Jesus, who died on the cross, but just as he said, rose again. Just as he said, he's faithful to his word. And this week we look at a faithful spirit and we continue to sort of work our way past you know, the cross and the resurrection and like, what is happening next? What's going on with the disciples? What are they doing? Where are they at? And so we get into Luke chapter 24 today and we see that a little bit. And as we see it, we get to see that Jesus, as he interacts with his disciples, we get to see Jesus introducing them and saying, get ready because this Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit power, this power that has been promised to you from God is coming. And I hope you're ready. You know, I was, as I was preparing uh, for this message and, you know, looking at the, how the Spirit works in our lives and looking and thinking about this power, this power that we have that Jesus is introducing to these disciples. You know, they're being introduced to a power that truly They've not experienced, but really in small doses, I want you to understand this. As Jesus had empowered them and they had already gone out and they had seen some, some great things, they have not been indwelled by it yet. They have not been totally filled with the Spirit of God. This is a power that they had not totally experienced. They had witnessed it, but not experienced it. There's a big difference. Let me explain that to you. Back when I was about... Nine, ten years old was probably one of the first times my dad took me turtle hunting. I know y'all laughed. A lot of y'all y'all go hog hunting, you know, you go deer hunting. Some of you like to go bird hunting, duck hunting. My dad liked to turtle hunt. You didn't even have to have a license for that. All right. And my grandparents owned uh, several hundred acres out in. Forney, and I know that's hard for you to believe because the way Forney looks now, but there used to be several hundred acres out there and all land, and my grandfather owned a lot of it. And we would go out and we would go to these little ponds and we would get to turtle hunt. And yeah, I mean, I know what you're thinking. We would get the BB guns and the 22s. No, that's not how you turtle hunt. Men that turtle hunt, turtle hunt with 357 Magnums. Yes, that's, what that's, that's how my daddy rolled, okay? 357 Magnum, ready to go. And, you know, those turtles would pop their little heads up in the water. My dad was like, quick draw McGraw. Boom! He would shoot those turtles, man. And we, we don't really know if he actually hit them or not, because, I mean, they just sort of disappeared. We don't know if they really swam down to the bottom and never came back. But that was turtle hunting. And I had experienced turtle hunt, you know, with my dad. We would go out there and we would experience this turtle hunt. And I would watch him shoot that cannon, 
for a you know an eight year old, that's what a 357 Magnum is, and even for some of y'all, it still might be a cannon. He would shoot that cannon at those turtles, and you would just be like, "Look at that power!" But then one day, my dad's like, "Hey, why don't you take a shot?" And I, and I can remember, you know, when it was time for me to shoot that gun, I was I was I was anxious. I was a little scared. I saw that power revealed in my father's hand. Now it's going to my turn, right? But my dad just didn't, you know, throw me the gun here and said, shoot it. But he said, hey, let me, let me get you ready. Let me, let me prepare you. Let me show you how to hold it. You know, he went over some gun safety. And he said, you know, before you go and we turtle hunt, you know, you've got to be prepared. And so, you know, he taught me everything. And, I, and there I went. I became a turtle hunt machine from that point forward. <laughs> So when the apocalypse comes and the rest of y'all are feasting on deer and duck and turkey and wild hog, you come to Pastor Craig's house and we'll have turkey or uh, love turtle stew. All right. So, but you know, the, when I thought about that, I, when I was thinking about Jesus and He's introducing these disciples, you know, to the power of the Holy Spirit and introducing to them about what they're about to experience, and specifically what we really are thinking about and talking about is the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit in their life. I just recalled that moment, how my dad just sort of walked me through that moment of shooting that gun and experiencing that power. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus is beginning this. He's walking them through something that they are about to experience. They're about to, the, the Holy Spirit is about to come down on them at Pentecost. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that far away. And they're about to experience all of it. And so he is getting them ready and getting them ready for that faithfulness that's coming down to them. So in chapter 24 of Luke, we're going to back back up. We're going to start reading in, in verse 44. So if you have your Bible, get there, verse 44 in Luke chapter uh, 24. Or uh, if you open up your FBC Edom app and you go to events down there, you can find sermon notes. And you can follow along right there on my sermon notes exactly where I'm at. Um, and follow right along with us in Luke chapter 24. Let me pull my old man glasses out here. All right, Luke chapter 24, verse 44 says this. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That is important, okay? I need you to understand that that is important because he is reminding them that everything he's telling them now, they've already heard before. In just a moment, when we begin to sort of review this text and go through it and break it down, you're going to see, we're going to go back to a conversation they had in John chapter 14 when Jesus opens up about who the Holy Spirit is and the role that the Holy Spirit is going to play in their life. So right here in verse 44, when Jesus says to him, these are the words which I spoke to you, past tense, while I was with you, and that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets, about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer again, from, that Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sin would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So before we get to verse 49, Jesus, he's come. The scripture tells us back up into verse 36. He has come again to meet with the disciples. Again, they are meeting the resurrected Jesus in the flesh. And they're still struggling a little bit. Okay, they are still struggling, honestly, with doubt and unbelief. And so Jesus like shows up and he's like, hey, here I am again, guys. Hang on, don't be scared. You know, I come in peace. It's me, Jesus in the flesh. Look, here's my hands. Here's the holes. Here's the holes in my feet. Check me out. And even goes as far as, well, hey, if you want to see that it's me and that I'm real, give me something to eat. And they give him a piece of fish that they had broiled. And so Jesus begins to eat that fish. And as he's eating this fish, that's when he comes into verse 44 and begins to say, okay, hey, let me lay this out there for you. And so what he's laying out for them is, hey, we've already talked about this. You know what's going on. And now we're getting to that point. You have witnessed. Remember, there are witnesses, it says in verse 48. You are witnesses to the fact 
that I am the Christ, that I died on the cross, and that I have risen again. You have witnessed this. Now your job is going to be, if you look in that text, to go and proclaim. You go out and proclaim who I am. You go out and proclaim what I've done, that you are eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is risen from the dead. Go do it. But before you go, wait just a second. Because we got to read verse 49. Before you go, behold, behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. So Jesus tells them that, yes, you've got a job. And your job is to go and to proclaim the gospel. Your job is to go and to be my witnesses. But before you go do this job, you need help. You need help. And because I'm a faithful king, he says, because God is a faithful God, because we are faithful, we are sending a faithful spirit that will walk alongside you, that will be there with you, that I already told you about. He's coming. Behold and get ready. Amen. But stay here until it gets here. Stay here until the time is right and you're going to know it. So when we look at this text this morning and we, we go through this, we see Jesus, he's encouraging, he's instructing, he's empowering the apostles to go out and fulfill the great commission which they are called to do. And they're going to do that by the promise of the Holy Spirit that they will receive. So when we look at this text right here in verse 49, I believe there are three things that we see in Scripture that Jesus illustrates to the apostles that the Spirit is faithful and he demonstrates these things right there in the life of them. And he'll be faithful in our life as well. We can see that demonstrated through this text. So follow along with me as we look at it. And the first thing that we learn is about the encouragement of the Spirit. The Spirit is faithful to encourage you. He's there to walk alongside you and to encourage you. The presence of the Spirit brings encouragement to every believer. Every person that has placed faith in Jesus Christ has that indwelling of the Spirit that goes with them, and the Spirit is there to walk alongside them and encourage them. In verse 49 in Luke 24, it says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. When we look and we see that word sending, that word sending is like sending out with authority. It's just not like me sending, you know, sending you a present in the mail. You know, it's just not like Amazon sending your package to your home. This would be like a king sending out, you know, the captain of the guard on a very special assignment to carry out all authority that that king has given him. So when Jesus says, behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, they realize and should begin to recall what that promise is. That that promise is the Spirit of God that is going to come and indwell them. They ought to be having flashbacks. Have you ever, have you ever had those moments? You, sometimes we call them deja vu. And we say, man, it feels like I've been here before. It feels like that I've heard somebody say that before. Well, they should have begun to start to have deja vu at this point. And specifically deja vu going back to John chapter 14. Now, they didn't consider it John chapter 14. But what they should have considered, considered is during that last week that Jesus was alive, when he sat down with them and began to talk to them and began to encourage them and had that last supper, there was a lot of things that they went through. John covers that in his gospel. He covers in detail a lot of the things that Jesus went through with them in those last days. And specifically in John 14, he went through the, the role and the promise of the Holy Spirit. So as he sits there and Jesus tells them, you know, behold, I'm, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. They should begin to sort of think back to John 14, 16, when Jesus said, then I will ask the father and he will give you another helper so that he may be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth whom the world 
cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. You Do you get that? The world does not see him or know him. The world cannot experience him in the way that those that have placed their faith in Jesus do. It is a totally different experience. It's totally different when you grab that 357, you put it in your hand, you pull the trigger, and you blow a turtle to, the, to oblivion. It's completely different than just sitting there and watching it happen. And the scripture tells us, the scripture tells us, that the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Jesus is saying, I'm with you. And one day my spirit will be in you to never leave you. And this is to bring them encouragement. Remember, we're not far from the crucifixion of Jesus. You know, I don't consider, you know, PTSD something to take lightly. I know that a lot of people in our society, especially that have been through some very traumatic things, whether it be in the military or whether it be as a first responder or whether it just be they are a victim uh, of something tragic, PTSD is something serious that people deal with after they've dealt with a trauma. The disciples, I want you to understand, it wasn't, they, they, they weren't clinically diagnosed with PTSD, but they're suffering from it. The, the, what they witnessed happen to Jesus on the cross, the way they saw all of that take place, whether they were in hiding, looking around the corner, whatever, was not good. There's damage to them. There is mentally and emotionally, they are damaged goods. And they are working their way through this process. That's why even Jesus, this, the scripture says Jesus showed up again. It said the first time he showed himself to us and they're still a little freaked out. And so Jesus is trying, he's trying to bring them comfort. He's trying to bring them encouragement. He's trying to get them ready because there's coming a time that they're not going to see him anymore in the flesh. There's coming a time that they're going to have to go out and fulfill the job that they've been called out to do as the apostles. There's, they've got to go start the church. And to do that, they can't do it by themselves. And so the scripture says, and Jesus said in John 14, that the father, this promise, he's going to give you another helper, a parakletos, as it says in the Greek, which means basically a counselor or a defender that walks beside you, that is there to encourage you, to give you confidence that you aren't going into this alone, that he is there with you and he's got, he, is, he has got everything he needs for you to be successful. He is walking beside you. So we see through this that no matter what we walk through, that as we are called out as the church, to continue to proclaim the gospel, to continue to be witnesses of God's goodness and faithfulness as he's called us out to do that. And it can be scary. It can be scary to go and to confront somebody with the gospel. It can be scary to go into situations that don't look so great, but yet you realize that you are called out. Maybe God has called you out to a specific uh, ministry. Maybe God has called you out to a specific mission field. And you look and you're like, man, I, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm equipped. Be encouraged today that the spirit of encouragement that he walks beside you to help you face whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is that you face. The scripture said that he sent you that helper in John chapter 14 so that he may be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him and because he remains with you and will be in you. Verse 27 in that same text in John 14, Jesus goes down and says, peace, I leave you. I mean, one of the things when you talk about encouragement one of the things that we're, we, we look for that help encourage our spirit is just peace. Just, just, just all around us is just chaos. We live in a world of chaos. Satan is constantly causing chaos around us. But Jesus and the spirit in his faithfulness brings peace. Peace I leave you. 
The spirit is peace I leave you, not peace I give you, not as the world gives. I give it to you. Do not let your heart be troubled or fearful. I, I, I would assume that those disciples are just honed in on what Jesus is saying at that point. And I would assume that there is a movie reel in their mind playing back those moments that they had as they talked with Jesus. And I believe their spirit was encouraged. The second thing the spirit does, though, that we see in this text is it instructs. The, 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 the wisdom of the spirit brings guidance into our life. Think about this. These guys are about to be truly the first church planters in all of history. I mean, what does that look like? I mean, nowadays, if you want to be a church planter, you know, if you're going to be a Southern Baptist church planter, you've got to go, what we were looking at earlier, to the North American Mission Board. They're going to put you through all kinds of seminars and classes. They're going to be people beside you and prepare you. There's nobody to do that. These guys are walking out there with this calling upon their life as Jesus has called them out to go and start the church and they're like, man, how in the world are we going to do this? Jesus, what does this look like? You said we must proclaim and be witnesses, but look at this chaotic world that we're in. Look what they did to you. How are we going to accomplish this? And Jesus tells them, which is very, very important that we see here. Jesus tells them, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you. When you get that, when the promise is upon you, you're going to be activated and ready to go. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Jesus instructs them in that moment to stay, to be still, to not move. I think that so many times we can sometimes jump ahead of God just in sometimes our enthusiasm, sometimes just, you know, hey, here, let's go. You know, sometimes even fear causes us to jump out there too soon. But Jesus tells them, you need to wait. If you go back in that same text, we realize that because there's a giant plan that starts here. And one of the waiting is it starts in Jerusalem. We're not starting outside of Jerusalem. We're starting right here because this is where it's going to be. This is where it starts. So you need to wait. And you need to wait until the power is upon you. What we realize here is Jesus is embarking this wisdom upon the, upon the apostles here. As he's instructing them to stay, we're reminded that the Holy Spirit, Jesus inside of us, the spirit of the living God, speaks to us, sometimes telling us to wait, sometimes telling us to go, but whatever. He speaks this wisdom and discernment into our life. And we have to pay attention to it. We have to listen. I'm sure that as they were sitting there and they're listening, again, they keep going back to that moment that they are sitting there with Jesus and he's explaining in detail the Holy Spirit. And in verse 18 of John chapter 14, he says, I will not leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you. When you think about an orphan, you know, you think about an orphan, especially in that day. An orphan would have been somebody without any resources. An orphan, when it's in, used in that text, is going to be somebody not just without a father or leadership in their house, but it's going to be somebody that is totally alone, that has no wisdom of a, a, a mature person in their life. Most likely they're living on the streets, trying to just fend for themselves in any way that they can. And what Jesus is trying to tell the, the apostles in that moment is, I'm not just leaving you to fend for yourself. I know you don't have all of this figured out. I know you don't know which direction to go. I know you don't know what's going on. And I will be there with you in all of my wisdom, in all of my discernment. I will be there with you to walk you through this moment. This parakletos as your helper, as your counselor, I am going with you. I'm going ahead of you. So stay with me, he's saying. You wait here because it's coming. It is coming. And, and I'm sure they begin to think about those words. They begin to think about that. I think about that orphan. I just think about kids, obviously. And, 
and how just irresponsible kids are. And then Sammy gets up right when I say that. <laughs> Interesting. But I think about how just, just irresponsible kids, just they do things on their own. They don't think about things. They just do things on the fly, right? That's why they have parents. I can remember the first time I left my kids alone. Now, I've told this story before, but man, it, 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 was, it was a funny time. My wife and I lived in Waxahachie. We lived right around the corner from uh, Olive Garden. I should have got an amen. I know you're hungry. We lived right around the corner from Olive Garden. So we decided about 10 years ago that Allie would have been probably around 11. Grant would have been probably around 9, 10, or 9 or 8 or 9. And we were like, okay, well, they'll be okay. We're right around the corner. We've got our cell phones. If they need us, they can call us. We're just going to dinner. So we left and we went over to Olive Garden to have dinner. We're sitting in Olive Garden having dinner, right? We're having dinner. I looked down at my cell phone at some point and I realized I had like 17 missed calls. Oops. You know, oops. We hadn't answered the phone. They had been calling us. Well, guess what happened? They were at home, alone, by themselves. And everything was going great until the electricity went off. Yes. No electricity, no lights, dark. They are freaking out, right? They're thinking in their 11-year-old mind, they're thinking somebody's done cut the electricity, they've got a knife, they're coming to get us. We're about to die. So, let's call Dad. Dad doesn't answer. Let's call him again. Dad doesn't answer. Well, guess what? Then the lights and electricity click on magically. You know, y'all have seen that happen before when you just have, you know, little power surges and things like that. Oh, lights back on. Well, when the lights come on, so does the printer in the office. And so if you've ever heard a printer, it's coming on. They thought it was the garage. Again, 11, 8, Lack of wisdom, lack of discernment, nobody there to help them. They're freaking out. The guy with the knife has turned the electricity back on so he can open the garage. Oh, Jesus, what are we going to do? So dad doesn't answer. We need an adult. We need an adult here now. So how do you get an adult in an emergency situation? You call 911. So 911 gets called. Mona and I just chilling at Olive Garden, eating in fettuccine Alfredo and lasagna. We're, everything's great over at Olive Garden. In the meantime, Allie and Grant are hunkered down in the closet, hiding from the man with the butcher knife, waiting for the police to get there. What they needed, and that would have never happened if they would have had a mature adult that would have been there at that time that could have discerned, had the wisdom to discern that, hey, that's just a printer that's coming back on. The electricity probably just went off because those just those kind of things happen. You know, sometimes those things happen. There are power surges. There are different things. It's back on. Everything's okay, but they didn't have that. And so when we think about the Holy Spirit in our life, that Holy Spirit going back even to bringing peace, brings peace, calmness, wisdom, and discernment, this instruction is faithful there to bring this instruction to guide us through life. In, in verse 25 of John chapter 14, in that conversation that they should be remember going back to, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you while I remain with you. He's telling them that because he's like, you know, I'm about to leave and I need you to remember these things. You need to be able to recall these things. I'm telling you this for a purpose. And in verse 26, he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all the things I've said to you. That's his job. He is faithful to encourage us. He is faithful to instruct us. He is our guide. He is our wisdom. And without him, what would we do? And the last thing that we see is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The scripture says in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed 
with power from on high. Till you are clothed with that, remember that word power in the Greek is dunamis, same word we get dynamite. I've told you that several times. When we are clothed with that explosive boom power and you feel it, it comes upon you. It is there with you. It will never leave you. That's what the scripture says. When you are clothed with that power from on high, you wait because it is coming, this power that you need because you will be my witnesses. You will proclaim the gospel and you won't do it alone. And there's empowerment. This power from the spirit is going to bring perseverance and victory to their life. And isn't that what we all need today? It is the power of the Spirit that persevered those saints, those apostles, that first church through all the persecution, through everything that they experienced, through all the discouragement that that first church had to go through, through all the fighting in the business meetings. By the way, they did have business meetings. Most of the time they didn't complain too much about money, but it was about circumcision and stuff like that. But they had them and they fought through them. And the Spirit of God was in the midst of them. And it empowered them to persevere through ultimately being victorious. And we still have that church today here as the Holy Spirit abides in believers. We still function as the church and we can still persevere through. No matter what you are going through today, you can still persevere through through the power the dunamis power of the spirit you can push through no matter what it is you face no matter how big the challenge is you can push through push through i'll tell you one of the one of the things that i'm encouraged by the most here recently um, and she's not in here so i'm going to talk about her um, but is autumn who is g and you may not know who g is but G was our servant spotlight this week. And G has, feels the Lord has called her now to Costa Rica. And not for a one week trip like we've been going on. She's gone on the last two with us. She's extremely helpful. All right, G, G has this love for Jesus that just pours out of her and it attracts not just kids, but adults. And they see it and she's bilingual, which is a huge plus. And she says, Pastor Craig, I just feel like there's more I need to do there. And so in the next few weeks, Pastor Craig is going to take G and drop her off in Costa Rica for six months. And she's going to spend the next six months in Costa Rica. And some of you looking going, how in the world can somebody just leave and go and do that? Well, number one, because she is led by the Spirit of God that is indwelling her and taking her across the world to go sit in Costa Rica with Kimberly and Juan for six months, sharing the gospel, spreading the gospel, proclaiming that she is a witness to what God is doing, not just in her life, but in others' lives. That's what she has planned to do, and she's taking the Holy Spirit with her. She has nothing to fear. She has nothing to worry about because God has gone before and he's going with her because she's empowered that's what it looks like. We, we should be empowered by the Spirit of God to do the unthinkable, to do the things that people wouldn't think that we would do because that's just not even in our character. How in the world could you step out and do that because of God's power that is in my life? Jesus was telling them, hey, you got to wait, but it's coming. And the power of the Most High God is going to be clothed upon you it is going to swallow you up and it is going to help you persevere and bring, bring victory to what you are doing. And I'm sure in their minds, in this moment, they're thinking back to that conversation that's recorded in John 14. When Jesus sat in front of them and he sat there after he was telling them that he wasn't leaving them as orphans, but he's coming to them. And in verse 19, he said, after a little while, the world no longer is going to see me. The world will no longer see me, but you're going to see me. 
And in the midst of him just sitting there with them, with his broiled fish, you know, with garlic butter on top, <laughs> sitting there with them, they probably begin to remember that. The world is not going to see him, but we're going to see him. And here he is in our midst. And he said, the world will not see me, but you are going to see me because I live, also you will live. Amen. He is telling them, because I overcame the grave, because of Resurrection Sunday, you will live. That same resurrection power that shook the world is going to be inside of you. You're going to be walking the earth as my witnesses with that power inside of you, working through you. And he says in verse 20, and on that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. There will be no doubt that you are mine. There will be no doubt who you serve and there will be no doubt what you can do. In that moment, you will know. My question for you is, do you know? Do you know that the power of God resides inside of you? Do you know that power? Have you experienced that power in your life? Are you utilizing that power daily to be witnesses proclaiming the gospel? Are you using that power daily in your life as you disciple your family? Are you using that power daily as you go to work and witness for Jesus? Are you using that power daily? Because it should be there if you have given your life to Christ. It's the evidence of your salvation. Paul, he said in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul wrote in verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Don't be mistaken. Not, we are not all children of God. No matter what the world may tell you, as they say, we all need to get along. We all need to accept each other because we are all children of God. That is contradictory to exactly what Jesus said in John chapter 1 and what Paul is saying in Romans chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 14. We are not all children of God. Only those that are led by the Spirit of God have the right to be called sons of God. For you have not received, in verse 14, 15, you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption because we're not orphans. You have received a spirit of adoption uh, that which cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies within our spirit that we are children of God. If you are a child of God, the Spirit is inside of you testifying to that fact. You should know that dunamis power. It is what makes all things new. You should know the wisdom and discernment of God in your life because it is in there. You should feel that encouragement every day and you should be clothed with the power from on high as you go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Amen. So my question is, do you know? Remember, Jesus said, you will know. Do you know? Right now, can you be sure that the Spirit of God inside of you resides inside of you and you know that Spirit and you it testifies within you I used this example, and so I had to run and get me a balloon. As I was telling others this morning in the first service, by the way, this is what you get in the second service if you don't come to the first service. I get to go get supplies. And I used the example of a balloon. And I wish I could use, a, a, I wish I could use this balloon and use it as a better example, but I don't have everything I need. But when you think about the Spirit of God and the power of God and how you're clothed in that power from on high, 
I first want you to think about balloons. See this balloon? This balloon like this is really worth nothing. It's empty and lifeless. There's nothing in it. And those of you that sit in here today that truly have never experienced the forgiveness and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've never given your life to him, you've never made him your Lord and Savior. I'm not asking you if you've gone to church. I'm not asking you if you've gone to church camp. I'm not even asking if you volunteer and hold up a sign out there, but we are very thankful for our sign holders. <laughs> I'm asking you that you have engaged in a relationship with the living God, Jesus Christ, because he died on the cross for your sins. He rose again, having victory over those, and you've given him your life, and you are pledging that you're going to live for him. And, and when you go into that covenant moment where you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, the scripture says that Jesus, the spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, comes inside of you and dwells there. And that's what we're talking about today. And Paul said there in Romans 8, verse 16, that that spirit cries out in you, Abba, Father, testifying that you are a child of God. But without that, you're empty. And you're just looking for something. You're searching. And maybe that's why you're here today is because you're searching. And you know there's more. But right now you're just empty. But when you do come become a believer, when you become clothed in the power of the Most High God, the Spirit is injected into you. You see that the Spirit now, all of the Spirit of the Most High God is put inside this vessel that you walk around in on this earth. So that you can be a witness, so that you can proclaim how he has made you new, how he's changed your life, how that you can go and be an encouragement to others and a witness, an eyewitness to the fact that God can do great things and that he is faithful. And that spirit is put inside of you to make you into something totally new, totally new. For God's glory. It's no longer flat and inflated. But it's big, round, and usable. You know, if I was really smart, I would have went and got me some helium. Because when Pastor Craig interjects his spirit into you like this, it just sort of flows to the bottom but that scripture says that when you're clothed with the power of the most high God, you're going high. You can do great and mighty things for the glory of God. That resurrection power is in you and can be used in a mighty way unless you hold it back. You know, when we do go buy those, when we do need balloons that have helium in them, you know, like, Allie's birthday yesterday, was 20, she was 21 years old yesterday. My baby girl, 21. A lot of times, and maybe on one of the other birthdays, daddy might have gone to, you know, the Dollar Tree or, you know, the grocery store or Walmart, and I'd go buy the balloons. And usually you can go back to a certain section. A lot of times it's where the flowers are. You ever notice if they have those balloons already inflated with helium, they tie them to something, why? so they don't fly off. So that the power that is in those helium balloons that make them fly is restricted by the string that is tied to whatever is weighing them down. And the problem with the church today, and when I say the church, I mean the church in general, is we've allowed Satan to still keep a hold of us, right. and he's tying us down. Yeah. And it affects our families, it affects our life, it affects our witness. And I want you to know there are some of you here today, you are a child of God. And the, the power of the most high God is clothed upon you and inside of you. But you've allowed Satan to tie you down, to not use you. And it could be because of fear. It could be because of skepticism and doubt. 
All of these things the disciples are dealing with as Jesus approaches them that we see in Luke chapter 24 as he's eating his fish. He sees them. He's, they're dealing with all of this. And he's saying, you're going to go. You're going to be clothed with the power of the most high God and you're going to fly and you're going to persevere and you're going to be victorious. And today, some of you have experienced that power but you've allowed Satan to tell you now. Let's cut that string today. Let, let's let it loose. God is calling some of you to do some great and mighty things. Not, not, not here just in the church, but in your family, in, in, in your workplace. He may be calling you to go to Costa Rica or Uganda. He may be calling you to go to China or Japan. He may be calling you to go somewhere else in this world, but he may just be calling you to go across the street. But fear, doubt, it's tied you down and Satan's got you right where he wants you. Let's cut it today. Let's cut it loose. Allow the power of Christ inside of us to help us persevere and fly. I'm reminded in, I'm reminded in 2 Timothy, Paul is trying to encourage Timothy. And he tells Timothy, he says, hey, I know where you come from, Timothy. I know what you're dealing with, but I know where you come from. I know your faith. Your faith has been handed down to you, Timothy, from your mother and from your grandmother, and it is strong. And so he tells him in 2 Timothy 1, 6, he says this, for that reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He says, kindle afresh the spirit of God inside of you. Get it moving, get it working, get that flame hot. When it's talking about kindle afresh, it would be like we've got that bonfire outside for the youth just a couple of weeks ago. And as that thing would die down, we would move that wood so that more air would have access. We would put it up a little higher and put some smaller pieces in it and put the pizza boxes underneath it. And that was kindling it up so that it would burn higher and hotter. And if you will kindle up that fire with inside of you, you will kindle up that power of the Holy Spirit that is in there. If you will do that, it will burn that string loose and Satan will have to let go and you, my friend, will be persevering and victorious in your life. Right. But you've got to kindle it together because he told Timothy this. He said, for I have not given you a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline. Just work it up. I want you to understand this as we close. So many times we talk about salvation and you hear me talk about if the, the spirit of God is in you, it should testify that you are his child. It should be crying out and that's how you know. And my question for you a while ago was, do you know? And what I want you to know is this. So many times we come to church and we hear the preacher talk about that we need to be saved and we need Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, which is true. And by the payment of the cross, we have forgiveness. By the resurrection, we have life. And through that, we can be saved. But salvation is more than a free ticket to heaven. Salvation is more than just eternal life in heaven. Salvation is you being united with the one holy God of the universe. Having a relationship with him and him indwelling you. You get that now. All of that encouragement, all of that power, all of that wisdom, it comes now as soon as you accept Jesus. Why wouldn't you want him? Why wouldn't you want him? If you sit here today and you question it all, whether the spirit of God is inside of you and you don't know and you want to know, I don't want you to leave here without knowing. In just a moment, you're going to have an opportunity. Take advantage of it. Come talk to me. If you can't come talk to me in just a moment, wait till afterwards, catch me after church. Don't struggle with not knowing, but find out today. But maybe your struggle isn't not knowing. But maybe your struggle is that strain that is attached and holding you back and holding you down. And today you say, Pastor, I just need you to pray and help me kindle the fire that will break that string and burn it loose so that I can fly high, clothed in the power of the Most High God, 
and do exactly what I'm calling you to do. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. God, as we come to this moment, Lord, I pray for those that are in this room right now. Lord, I pray first for those that might be struggling, Lord, as they're just going through life, because we do that. We go through life. There are struggles. There are things that hold us back. There are things that hold us down. And Satan uses those things to stop us from being the witness that we're called to be. He does those things to stop us from discipling our families. He does those things to stop us from experiencing your peace and your joy. Lord, there are some strings that need to be broken in here today. There are some people that Satan is holding back from truly experiencing your power in their life. And God, I pray that today the fire of the Holy Spirit that is kindled up inside of them will burn that string loose. That they'll let loose of whatever it is that's holding them back and be set free to follow the call in their life, to follow you wherever you go. And Lord, I pray for that one that may be here today. I pray for the person that might be here today that doesn't know. They're looking inside and they're like, I don't know. The Spirit is supposed to testify within me. I'm supposed to feel this power and I'm supposed to know this forgiveness and I don't know. God, if they, if they, Lord, if they're struggling with that right now, Lord, I don't want them to leave here today without, without having confidence. Your Spirit brings us confidence and encouragement and instruction and empowerment. And I want them to leave here today knowing that they are a child of the Most High God, knowing they walk out of here with the power to persevere and be victorious. And so today, God, if they are here looking and searching for you, I pray they find you. I pray that your Holy Spirit begins to work on them right now, drawing them in. But we give this moment, this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, we're going to sing one last song. You're here today and God is working on you, working in you. You want me to pray with you to cut that string loose or help you know for sure that you know Christ. Come find me right up front. God love the opportunity to pray with you. As we open our altar, would you stand and sing?